and welcome to TED Summit Innovators. We've got uh, Matthew Smith here again. Matthew, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Thanks, Alan. Great That's to great. be on the show again. And from his vacation in Florida, we have Johnny. Johnny, how are you? Yeah, why don't you just tell Abby Cat where I am? Uh, <laughs> it's a state. It's big enough. I know. I'm going to get a subpoena. I'm going to get a subpoena in like an hour. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, my favorite, Matthew, I couldn't miss the Absolutely. guardian of institutional memory. That's it. My gar our guardian of the galaxy. <laughs> the only guy that can make my head really hurt. But then I got to find a way to understand him. The, exactly. the only guy, the only podcast I've ever been on or anybody I've ever talked to, when I asked him if he needs capital, he said, nah, we're okay. <laughs> so yep. if you need donations for charity or anything like that, call Matthew because he's got the rock solid co company and he walks the walk. So. Exactly. Let's get into this, guys. Cool. So the theme is going to be around Industry 4.0 or, you know, the fourth industrial revolution. But Matthew's going to talk more about that in a minute. Now, within TAD Summit, programmable uh, industrial IoT has been a theme for several years. And of course, when we're discussing those topics, we get a lot of Industry 4.0 folks like Matthew in who've joined us over the years. Now, the other thing is we have our truth in theme uh, where you know, we point out the reality because just like in telecoms, Industry 4.0 has its share of uh, BS and we do tend to attract the mavericks, the independent experts who tend to be correct and cutting through all the BS and pointing out what's really going on. So. Given that sort of commonality, given the overlap over the years, we're going to add to TAD Summit uh, for this year an Industry 4.0 theme. So, Matthew, please explain what's going on with this fourth industrial revolution. Yeah, absolutely, Alan. So, look, you know, you're going to come across two terms. One is industry 4.0 which yeah. originally was a federal german government initiative mm -hmm. that started actually the very early seeds of it were around 2008 2009 yeah. but it was launched to great fanfare at the hanover mess this big german yeah. industry trade show in 2011 and it was a way to sort of promote German excellence. You know, Germans are really great for building machines and capital yep. goods that are used in manufacturing. And it was all really about building networked manufacturing. Okay, and that, that's where there's an interesting, you know, sort of intersection with the telecom world is mm -hmm. we're talking about things that are connected, that they are networked. And that term has stuck is industry 4.0 the right word? I don't know, but a lot of people are using it and it does land. So when we do talk about modernizing manufacturing and again, doing things beyond what we call IoT and Internet of Things, industry 4.0 seems to be appropriate. Now, alongside that, there's this term fourth industrial revolution, which sounds a little bit BS. Um, there are some folks that see it as synonymous with Industry 4.0 um, because it tracks kind of the timeline from the very first industrial revolution, which had to do with the steam engine. Mm -hmm. And we have the second industrial revolution, which has to do with the assembly line. Yep. So, uh, you know, the Model T Ford automobile. The third industrial revolution has got to do with automation. So this is the introduction of the PLC or the programmable logic controller and the use of the very first set of digital and computer technologies inside manufacturing. And this fourth industrial revolution is meant to be where things become data driven and uh, networked and there's artificial intelligence and all of those good things. And it starts to get very nebulous from there. Right. It's also kind of synonymous with certain agendas in the world, which are all about the concentration of um, 
manufacturing and the concentration of the investment in manufacturing. If we look at where we are today, we have some very big companies. Companies have got extremely large and they're backed by serious money as well. Hedge funds, huge financial uh, backing. And uh, that does create an interesting scenario where imagine a world where there were only very, very, very large companies where you basically had a combination of monopolies on one hand and monopsomies on another. So Giovanni, I know I'm using a big word there. So- no, no. I mean, look, you, yeah, again, we're talking about hedge funds and different things, but we haven't, I mean, I, I just want to mention the 800 pound gorilla DCP manufacturing. Yeah. I mean, so what, what, so I guess my question is for later in, in the podcast. I, I see where you're going, but aren't they leading the way, or is that a facade that we're just being told in the media? So, who's leading the way? I think that's a key question, right? So, uh, in your view, who would you think leads the in way? My, in my view, based on on where I live and what I see in the media, and where, where I go into the store and what everything says on it, it's China, which I like calling the CCP. China's a yeah. Country with nice people. CCP sure. is an organized crime family that runs it. You're damn, you're damn right. And yeah. so we have also over the last um, 25 plus years, and this is really something that has kicked into high gear, um, I would say in the last 25 years, is that there has been a whole scale shift of manufacturing and all of the related industries outside of the advanced economies. And this really accelerated 20, 25 years ago. Uh, It was something that certainly started in the 70s after the oil shock and, um, uh, you know, some of the recessions that occurred. And um, certainly in the 80s, where you had Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan in the US, uh, who, again, put some uh, neoliberal economic policies in that, uh, again, were aimed at, on one hand, finance, and on the other hand, consumption. So in the advanced economies around the world, it's all geared around consumption. So economic health, economic activity is kind of measured by how much are people consuming? And we don't care about where stuff is manufactured. And obviously the financial means to be able to consume comes from the financial system. And it's like, well, don't worry, you know, goods that we buy, products that we buy, well, they come from somewhere else. Yeah, don't worry, China can manufacture that. And that's caused this very interesting geopolitical situation right now. So um, it's, it's kind of- causing destruction of half of the country. I mean, from Ohio to Allentown to, you know, parts of Pennsylvania and, and well, you know, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. I mean, I went to Pittsburgh 30 years ago, different city. Uh, yeah. Destruction of America, small time, small town America, manufacturing. So, whatever they did back then, and I think it was Clinton uh, that opened up the just just to, just to make a point on that that opened it up. Um, it, it has a big effect. And now you talk about you're talking about Germany and 4.0 and data driven and where they're at. I, I'm, try, I'm trying to understand. You know, the leader is it China? In your view? Uh, n- no, far from it. I would really say, okay. Great. Um, this is great far, news. No, far from far from it. Okay, I would say that um, that is simply a um, again a bigger, uh, more solid. How can I say? There's more firepower thrown at it because there's CCP money. There's you know you yeah. know basically public money that subsidizes it. And I think that's very dangerous because, it, 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 you know, a lot of people look to China as a place to do contract manufacturing because yeah. you can get some really great unit cost for per article. But that is because the real cost is subsidized by the CCP. All right. But China is kind of like a refined version of Industry 3.0. I would say that the innovation that's coming out of China isn't anything near to what we're seeing in some of the sleepy European countries, which are finally waking up, and also in North America as well, which are finally waking up and saying, 
you know what? Hold on a second. Uh, we do need to actually have something in our real economy. We can't all be financialized and we can't just be consumers. And it's all about finding new, um, let's say, niche products, products which, again, this is a word that, Alan, you found a bit controversial, is hyper-personalized. So hyper-personalization is a thing. We, we refer to this as well as long-tail economics, yeah. right? So in order to find a way to differentiate what you do, instead of focusing on volume, you focus on quality and prestige. It's a premium. Mm -hmm. So where we're seeing a lot of new um, uh, manufacturing today is in luxury goods is on craft goods, goods that um, are, again, have a strong brand, a strong sense of values on it, and they're giving people a reason to buy better. Yeah. But, 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 but I think it's worth bringing it back to, because Johnny asked the question, who are mm -hmm. the leaders in using data in manufacturing? Right. So the two that get trotted out most of the time, and so if you listen to all the big thought leaders today out there, um, folks like Walker Reynolds, um, the two examples that get trotted out are Tesla for electric vehicles and Amazon for their logistics and distribution and warehousing. So both companies have had an interesting journey, right? I do think that Tesla is a great case study in terms of business strategy because of the way that they would they started with a premium product that was profitable and were able to kind of move into more volume you know products uh, for their cars uh, over time and the way that it's, they it's an innovation it's an innovation company I mean Wall Street was trying to bang his stock and he basically came back and said look what about my IP what about robotics. What about all the rest of the stuff I'm doing? They can't even quantify the valuation of Tesla because it's worth so much more than what the, even the market has it valued at. And that was the argument there. So yeah. you're, you're talking about two individual companies where I think I was looking at it for, from a regional standpoint because you brought up Germany and obviously everybody knows about German engineering and how annoying they are as people. And then we have the CCP um, and, and what they do there. I know how the United States has been completely cannibalized by the trade policies, which are now being changed. So, so you're, you're talking about the leaders. So the, so the leader is in the space, obviously, Amazon and Tesla, Tesla right? Yep. That yeah. really can't be copied. Um, no, and, um, and yet they can. But, uh, you know, I would say that Amazon... Uh, also plays uh, is 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 quite a dangerous entity. Okay, uh, if we it's look, a, at it's hugely dangerous. It's destroyed small business America. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's made people addicted to. I want it now. You get it in an hour. But, it's, but, it's completely how sure. it even was allowed to to excel in the U.S. is consumer driven. For, yeah. for, for for sure, but it's also about predicting and modeling consumer behavior. Exactly. So the. The frightening thing about Amazon, if you are a consumer, is that Amazon knows more about what you're most likely to buy than you do yourself. So, you know, and I, again, I'm just quoting what Walker Reynolds said on a keynote a week ago uh, yeah. of a digital transformation forum. He said that, look, Amazon can predict with 98% accuracy what you're going to buy six weeks from now. And they use that prediction to again manage their inventory and their and their and their ordering. Yeah. Which then obviously with their contract manufacturers uh, allows them to again plan manufacturing. Yeah. So that whole thing with data is just pretty wild. Um, but it's because again what Amazon have been doing is that they have been reinvesting progressively into building this flywheel. I remember being at a 
telco 2.0 uh event like back in 2009 that was organized by simon torrance and the gang in uh nice mm -hmm. and uh they invited Werner fochels the cto of amazon across and Vo Werner was there and Werner was talking about the flywheel strategy of amazon and this is pretty wild because there was a whole bunch of like senior people from the telecom world uh, in the room trying to get their heads around, you know, ooh, hold on, you know, uh, there's this new thing called cloud computing. Remember 2009 was still yeah. early days for the public cloud. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Vern already said like, look, it's all got to do with customer satisfaction, customer service, ensuring that customers have a great experience. Yeah. And I think that is for industry 4.0, that really is the key driver, right? Is delighting your customers and putting your customers and the usefulness, the value of your products center stage, right? So it's about having a stronger reason for demand for what you do that is um what it's all about and then everything kind of like hangs off that how you actually manufacture how you source your raw materials how you organize your shifts how you uh, again um have a uh operators in your factory floor people that are obviously aligned with that mission and that's more important with industry 4.0 than saying, well, actually your technology is obsolete. We need to change your technology. Or by the way, don't worry about your obsolete technology in this layer. So your automation layer, all you need is some shiny new software and everything will be great because there's some vendors out there and this we're touching on kind of some of the BS now, right? That's yeah. being trumpeted about is, oh, you know what? You can be like Amazon just by putting your software inside Amazon web services. And it's like, oh, you're missing the point, right? If you are cr cranking out products that people don't really want to buy and you have to go through great lengths to you know, force people to buy what you make because actually it isn't fit for purpose and you're not actually delighting your customers, and you're not then by in order, order to understand how customers are delighted, you're using data that your manufacturing process produces. Well, that's the trick. It's not at all anything to do with um, uh, the fact that, oh, I don't use the cloud. So I'm lagging behind, you know, and I'm going to somehow magically modernize my business by throwing all of my ERP and uh, my data collection and my IoT stuff with Amazon Web Services, because that's not going to change anything, yeah. right? Because you haven't actually transformed from inside yourself. Yeah. And you that's the, that's a key point because mm -hmm. you know because it just I mean what was it um, what's the name Tesla gives for its ERP? Is it Tesla Warp? I'm trying to remember now. Warp, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and there's companies I that have been founded. You know, from ex-employees of Tesla that are taking the principles of that platform and then applying it to other industries. So it's very, yeah. I mean, the, you know, ERP is one of the, uh, you know, it's, it's the building blocks within Industry 4.0. But also, as you're rightly calling out, there's a lot of hype and BS. It's like, it must be cloud. Well, no, it's got to be new. Well, it doesn't have to be. You can continue to use your existing you know, uh, legacy production line, but you just need to be able to measure it so you have an instantaneous view of mm. where your business is. Because, you know, I mean, just like we see in so many other industries, you know, when you talk to the executives around, well, you know, what's your data strategy? They sort of look at you weird. You know, they'll sort of say, well, here's our, you know, um, our transformation, our digital tr transformation strategy, you know, which is just utterly detached from uh, the reality of uh, operations technology and its integration into your information technology so that you have an instantaneous view of your business. And also you've got the metrics to start doing pretty accurate predictions around 
where you know how you can fulfill your customer needs because I mean, the, the bottom line is you know it's a production process it's manufacturing that's you know industry 4.0 so mm. the key is no matter what you say about all these transformation strategies what you say about safety compliance security it's all about the product that's you know getting that product out to fulfill customer demand it, it, it is king for um, product and price well, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, price, actually, prices drives everything. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's Alan. I'll challenge you on one thing. It's yeah, not about. It. It's actually not about the product at all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, it's it's about it's about the experience of the product. Yes. 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 So again, yeah. you know, one key strategic question to ask is like, who do I want my customers to become and use yes. that? Sort of drive how you are going to yes. put in a strategy for serving your customers better. And it just happens that the product you make is something that enables or delivers an experience. Yes. But it's an experience and the usefulness of that experience, which creates the demand. I will want to use the product. Um, and it could be the fact that I may ha possess something, yep. you know, put it on the shelf thinking of these crazy pop figurines that i've got <laughs> sitting up there uh I, which are still in the original boxes but oh I have dear some, uh, <laughs> i don't know it's 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 from mr robot that great tv show and i y you know for me that's useful and valuable because it's a memento of a really crazy show about you know um conspiracies and yep. um uh, politics and finance but you know what? I digress. The thing is, is that it's not about the product. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it is a bit more to do with the price. So Gianni, you're right when it comes down to sort of the price, because the price has to reflect the value. value yeah. right? And if I have a mismatch between the perceived value of the product and the price that I'm putting it on the market for, it means that I'm probably not going to be able to generate the profits that I need in order to, you know, keep my business turning, invest in new capabilities and continue to innovate. But it's not always about lowering cost. Okay. That's another thing that's, a, that, 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 that's also a subtlety here is yeah. it's very often not to do about lowering cost. In fact, sometimes you want to increase your cost because it enhances the experience. Okay. I'm, I'm a little bit just, so we talk about digital transformation, right? And just, yeah. I'm just curious. So obviously, as everybody knows, I'm the largest debt holder in a company called Tintech, and we were trying to sell the company. And big conversation that the CEO, Nicola Wolfram, would bring up was, well, we're, we're getting ready for the digital transformation. And I would look at her and say, what does that mean? What exactly does that mean? Why is everybody in our industry saying, oh, digital transformation? Okay, define that. I I'm still trying to understand what that means. You guys got me going on 4.0. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, digital transformation has become like such a hollow freaking term. It, yeah. it, 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 it literally has lost all meaning because Correct. it means so many different things depending on which flavor of marketing BS has been applied on a blog or on a, on, on some kind but of, it, it means nothing to smart money. It means nothing to wall street. No, it's, it's, it's gone right past them. Yeah. For, for, for sure. For sure. Look, one thing, and I will use the word digital here um, uh, because I, because it does mean something, right? So again, if we look at um, certainly from the seventies up until now, a lot of our enterprises, our, our, our corporations out there, whether they're in manufacturing or service business, um, are digitized, meaning that they're computerized. They, they use IT. Yeah. Okay. And on the factory floor, you tend to have automation, which uses, again, that's also computerized. It's just yeah. very specific types of computers that are used for controlling machines. And the digital transformation as a term 
talks about how you're going to transform all of that you which you already have that is computerized and digitized yeah. into something which again sets you up for future success it's recognizing that the old ways of working are no longer sufficient mm -hmm. um so that's a good segmentation in terms of the production line has focused on automation and within there of course it's being able to extract the data as part of that mm -hmm. automation cycle and then within the it side it's about computerizing all the processes but also that enables that it layer to be able to suck up the data that's being generated from the production line because of its automation uh now the the bit that i'm struggling with is because you've put the importance of customer experience as being what drives this whole chain well, well, yeah, exactly. Because if you don't have customers, you don't have a business. Yeah. Okay. If you don't have um, products that people want to buy yeah. and want to and and will experience using, I mean, you're going to struggle. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, everything really, when it comes down to what product you design, what pro yeah. if you are already have a product and. You know, how do you know that is demand increasing? Is demand declining? Is mm -hmm. the appetite for demand there? Mm -hmm. uh, are there some other shifts in the market that are, uh, again, affecting the attractiveness of the product? And all of yeah. that needs to be fed back into your, um, and typically this comes into your R&D team, right? So the folks that are researching, designing, and marketing. Yeah new products yeah. and the output stage of R and D and marketing really is to come up with, okay, here is a recipe, a formula for actually manufacturing product that is uh, in line with market demand. Gotcha. Understood. Okay. So it's almost right. like, is that part of the prediction? You're able to say, well, this is where we see, you know, sort of demand growing, and what impact does that have in a, a whole chain? Yes, exactly. So coming back to how this affects the factory floor, we've obviously got machinery and we've got people and we've got you know raw materials coming yeah, yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got a manufacturing process and we're cranking finished goods out. Yeah. And all of that needs to be tuned to uh, not only make the thing right, yeah. but also make the right thing exactly experience make the right experience well that's right so you're making the right thing in manufacturing that is going to produce the right, right experience, experience by Sorry. the customer yeah, yeah. Gotcha. and so gotcha. having feedback loops from customer experience back through the all of the things that um evaluate that experience yeah. and say oh here's how we can make our product better because it will be more attractive. It will be more useful. Yeah. That is important. So how you dynamically adjust your manufacturing process. And this again comes back to hyper-personalization. Gotcha. The uh, ability to, again, um, uh, let's say set up manufacturing of a product. Yeah. Okay. Because look, Doing custom products, you know, if I'm building something just for you, Alan, you know, to your taste, let's say I want to buy a, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good, a, a good example here. Probably the best example is what I'm wearing on my mm -hmm. head. Right? So okay, this is a brand, means, yeah. this is a brand of headphones called V Moda, mm -hmm. V dash M O D A, yeah. V Moda. You probably haven't heard of V Moda. V-Moda v -Moda are well known for DJs and for, oh, let's say, okay. high-end users yeah. of great headphones. These things are guaranteed for life. You can get replacement parts. And if things wear out, you just order the replacement parts. But what they do to enhance the experience is you can, when you order a pair, you can actually have it personalized for you in the factory. Now, so you what do they get, mean by personalized? Is it just like branding like you get with Apple where you can have a name and a message or what's yeah, the level of personalization? 
So it's got to do with colors. It's got to do with the anodized aluminum. It's gotcha. got to do with the straps. Band, it's yeah. got to do with the accessories. Gotcha. But also, you can actually upload your own logos, your own graphics, and have them uh, engraved gotcha. or etched into Understood. the thing. And yes, Apple will also do that. You can then you can have something engraved, right? Yep. Exactly. So oh, that's an example oh, of hyper personalization. Gotcha. And in order to do that, you need to be able to connect your, again, your 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 sales, yep. right? Ordering process, yep. that workflow. Collect and, data from the customer yeah. and dispatch it into manufacturing. Gotcha. Nope, makes a lot of mm. sense. Now we're running long because that does a make very sense. Interesting right. topic. So yep. what I'd like to do is we just put a bow on this because I think we're really. You know, done a great piece on understanding where manufacturing is going. Maybe we could just link it back a little bit to some of the uh, you know sort of programmable comms piece uh, and how critical that is in delivering on this industry 4.0 vision. Right, absolutely. Very. Yeah, and I think this is key, especially for the folks that are in your audience yeah. that are come from a telecom background yeah okay and 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 also we're mindful of where the landscape is has changed and is changing right changing, so yeah. fortunately a lot of folks who are in manufacturing on the factory floor still see telecom as a phone line with a phone you pick yeah. up you dial a number you call someone right yeah. i need to speak to my shift supervisor i'm going to pick up a phone on the factory floor and i'm going to dial an extension and i'm going to talk to the talk to talk to my boss right or if i need to call a, a, a you know a, a maintenance contractor i'm going to pick up the phone I'm going to dial their number that's that mental picture they have of telecoms yeah right? and i think bringing a fresh concept on what telecoms is all about especially yeah. programmable telecoms yeah. because look automation is also about programming and programmability talk about programming PLCs, programmable logic That's control, right. yeah, yeah. you know, and, um, and, and so how you program gotcha. is important. Okay. And yeah. if you are using old ways of working, you are never going to actually be able to dynamically program. Yeah. Okay. Cause it comes back to hyper-personalization. Yes. So yeah. I want my customer to send me something which forms part of the recipe for making a product, one yeah. unit, two units, 10, yeah. it doesn't matter how, how many units, but I need to send that into my manufacturing system. Exactly. And I need that to actually alter the programming of my machines. Yeah. And yeah. if I need to, uh, you know, schedule that, have a um, automation engineer or technician take that code up some ladder logic and yeah. then copy it into uh, via USB or via a laptop plugged into a PLC, that's inefficient. Yeah. And I'll never be able to digitally transform yeah. my manufacturing. Yeah. Yeah. So how we use APIs and how we use uh, modern interfaces for programming is yeah. key. Gotcha. And the manufacturing world can learn so much from telecom because telecom, strangely enough, is further ahead. Yeah. Because exactly. Telecom has always had a very strong sense of separation of concerns between yes. user plane. So this is my actual conversational data yep. on a phone call. My control plane, which is my signaling to set yes. up a call. My management plane, which is all about how I program and, and, and set up yep. my switching and transmission in my exactly. network. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Cool. Manufacturing doesn't actually have that sense of management control and and and, and user plane yep. in their in their definition. Yeah. It's all kind of thrown together. And 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 the dangerous thing I see in a lot of industry 4.0 with new software is it's not really taking this on board properly. Yeah. On one hand, or it's trying to say, well, no, but that's not our problem. That's a cloud vendor's <laughs> thing because they do that. You know, exactly. it's kind of like Kind of like in 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 um oh, that um uh, famous Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. Mm -hmm. There's this harsher part of gold, which it runs off a somebody else's problem field generator. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
I always have this mental picture of, oh, you're talking about a, somebody else's problem. Feel exactly. <laughs> this is, yeah, because this is really interesting because we are hitting what I see as a dichotomy in because within programmable comps, it's very focused, you know, just on the comps piece. It does mm. have some workflows. Don't get me wrong in terms of uh, marketing workflows, you know, and it's got them, you know, so, you know, pretty well ingrained in a lot of offers from programmable communications companies. But on the manufacturing side, I see that as a gap. It hasn't yeah. understood those workflows and it's being treated from the manufacturing side as well. That's just a utility. We just plug into the telecoms utility, you know, wham, bam, thank you. We're good. So that's exactly. really interesting. We've got that dichotomy we're facing, it, as, it, as, well, as well as a whole layer of BS as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there really is a lot of BS. But imagine this. I mean, imagine, you know, as part of your customer experience. And again, it's coming back to sort of like, why yep. am I in business? Why, yep. you know, why do people want to buy what I make, my products? Yep. Okay. And you know, when it comes to customers, and this works both in B2C and B2B, right? Yes. It's both consumer and business to business. Yeah. You know, at some point, there are going to be humans, yes. all right, choosing to buy, choosing to use, and having an experience. Exactly. And when we have humans in the loop, we are going to be using conversations. Exactly. We're going to be exchanging yep. with voice or video or some other kind of experience. But again, by using our senses, involving our senses. Exactly. Okay. All right. And because we have this heritage with telecoms, which at least has taken, you know, well, certainly our voice and our ability to listen to someone on the other end of a line. Yep. You know, oh, yeah. and, and 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 move that over great distances. Yeah. Okay. You know, if we can leverage that as part of the yes. customer experience, and I exactly. think this is where, you know, if you take a look at what Stroller are doing with VCon. Exactly. That's exactly what I was just thinking about. This is a great example. Yeah. And, cool. and, and, and I guarantee you that no one in manufacturing, in fact, I'm probably most of the only people that talks about Industry 4.0 that actually knows about VCons, because yes. I don't know anyone doing manufacturing systems or your know, automation that has ever heard of VCONs. Yes, and, 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 but and they we, should, because it comes back to customer experience. So on and, that note, because we are massively overrunning, <laughs> I want to thank you, Matthew. This has been a great exploration. I think we have now solidly identified the link back into the TADS community and the importance of understanding the reality, not the hype around industry 4.0. So Matthew, thank you. That was great. Thank you very much, Alan. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come on and have a chat with you guys. And uh, I don't know if you want to plug the um, TAD Summit coming up later this year. Oh, absolutely. We'll, we'll put that all we, we always want to plug TAD Summit. We always want to plug having The Guardian with us. So <laughs> we're, it's going to be pretty awesome. The Guardian of and the Fourth Industrial Revolution. There you go. You got the There you go. <laughs> And All again, right, Johnny, thanks for joining us from your vacation. Bye-bye, guys. You have a super time down in Florida, Giovanni.